Hey guys, so we decided to start a new series here at the Material World that will hopefully allow us to get content out to you quicker. We've been really busy over at the podcast and it's kind of holding us back technologically also. It's really difficult for us to make these animations that we've been putting out and we hope to sooner than later get around to animating light and electromagnetism in general. But we wanted to start talking about them in the meantime because these are really important topics and every single conversation that we have with a scientist over at the podcast seems to eventually terminate on something around electromagnetism and charge and what is that. Today, we just got off the phone with Nick Lane, who is a phenomenal biochemist studying the origins of life. And a lot of his work centers on the electron transport chain, which seems to be some sort of a wire-like device that is transferring charge. And we started talking to him about this concept of charge and what this really means, because for most engineers and really for most biochemists, it's an accounting book where you have this quantity of charge that's moving along and it's able to do work. And the question is, for us here at the material world, well, what are the atoms actually doing to allow for this uh, production of charge? Now, we put out a video, which we'll link up here, to show our conception of spin and what the surface of the atom might be doing during spin. And interestingly, there's a particular sort of rotation of the surface of the atom. And what we imagine is that when you bring multiple atoms into close contact with each other, that that surface motion can actually be transmitted between atoms, you know. Actually, in metals, it seems like the shells even merge with one another, and you actually get like a giant shell that might be capable in a conveyor belt sort of sense of causing a push force, of another rotatory force that's uh, commensurate at quite a distance. So we really wanted to take a moment and just explore the electron transport chain and, and imagine what could actually be happening, because if we don't have a material conception of it, we're left with all of these really spooky ideas like the flow of electrons or quantum tunneling. And we need to make sense of it. So when you ask somebody like Nick Lane, what is happening inside of the proteins and how is it that the electrons are being moved from the sugars over to the oxygen, which is the final electron acceptor in our metabolic model for aerobic respiration, you get the answer that what's happening is quantum tunneling because what people realize is that you have hydrogens that are snipped off of the carbon molecules. They're passed to proteins in the membrane. And those proteins that are inside of the membrane have metallic centers inside of them. And the metallic centers have this really beautiful, almost antenna-like configuration where you have a metal ion that is, or multiple metal ions, or atoms, I guess, which are complexed inside of sulfur atoms. And so the entire thing is, is this delicate cage that's held inside of the protein. And what they think is happening is that there's quantum tunneling that's going between these metallic centers inside the proteins. And there's, there's some flow of proteins through the membranes that are smaller. And so it's this very complex system of skipping charge from reaction center to reaction center to reaction center. But quantum tunneling is not really a physical interpretation of what's happening. It's literally just saying that it jumps. Like it's just something happens over here from some impulse over here. It's like a form of action at a distance, which is very spooky sounding. And right now, there's not a conception of the atoms being connected to one another. And I think that that's what's the 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 sort of the missing link here, right? Because if you have atoms that are totally disconnected from each other, and one reaction center is is resonating with this charge and it has to pass it to the other one. The only way that you can explain how it passes through that energetic uh, barrier is the fact that it's able to go through it somehow mysteriously. But the minute that you start thinking about atoms as being connected to one another and touching. Yeah, and touching as well. So there's two different aspects, right? So in our uh, radial atomic model, we have these uh, these thinned portions of the shell 
which we imagine are responsible for light and gravity. And so there could be these long-range electromagnetic effects, but you also have something that we imagine that's close to like a gearbox inside of the electron transport chain, where the atoms are capable of, in a very complex relay fashion, uh, pushing on one another, really, really pushing and, and entwining surfaces with one another, such that you can actually get convection of momentum at different lengths. And you can have even very complex switching algorithms in there that are disconnecting the shells of atoms from one another when appropriate. And when you extend this to the wider metabolic machinery of the cell, you can't help but think about water being involved as well, because we often talk about in basic biology, this proton gradient that builds up uh, in the mitochondria. But in reality, it seems like it's more... It seems like the number of protons that are actually found inside of this Christy space, which is, the, if you've ever looked at a picture of a mitochondria, there's like the, the squiggly inner membrane, and then there's the gap, that's the Christy space. If you actually do the calculation based off of the gradients that are measured, how many protons are in there, Nick Lane reports that there's like three protons in the entire Christie space, which doesn't make any sense because, as he also so amply points out, the end product of the reaction, this this absorption of uh, the, the, the oxygen turning into water, powers this ATPase, ATP synthase, and that makes your body weight of ATP every single day directly in a one-to-one -one relationship to the protons that are supposed to be passing through it. So there's a stoichiometric gap in our understanding here that is well known and I think has to do with the lack of material interpretation. Right. So if we just start thinking of them as different charge states, and when by charge we literally just mean one rotational uh, motion of a shell where uh, the opposite charge would just be the, the commensurate opposite rotational phase of that shell, then we can actually think about these atoms not as the, the protons being these discrete little particles that are doing things, but as just different motion phases of the same continuous body of interconnected atoms. So let's put a pin in it for today with that, and we'll see you guys again next week when we have another little process that we can use to untangle this electromagnetism from a material basis. Mm -hmm.